Thank you very much. This is one of the greatest governors in the history of California. The panel today is a, is a really terrific panel. Uh, I was addicted to Morning Joe for many years. Um, I finally went to a 12-step program and managed to at least wean myself off of the morning talk shows. Um, but uh, Mika Brzezinski and Joe Scarborough, the hosts of this program, I think are influential, considered very influential for a very good reason. Mika's a best-selling best author, career journalist, and television personality. As a daughter of a political family, Democrat to a Republican co-host and author of New York Times bestseller on the challenges of balancing career, family, and the news business. She brings a very grounded and personal view to our discussion navigating gridlock. Joe is the co-host and face of Morning Joe, a former Republican firebrand swept into office during the Republican wave of the Gingrich Revolution in 1994, multitasking while in Congress he founded an award-winning weekly newspaper, written two critically acclaimed books, Rome Wasn't Burned in a Day, and a New York Times bestseller, The Last Best Hope, Restoring Conservatism in America's Promise, and America's Promise. His latest book, The Right Path, How Republicans Once Mastered Politics and Can Again, I, which I read yesterday, is a must read for anyone in politics, I believe. Please welcome our terrific panelists here. Okay, so today's symposium is about the current state of partisan gridlock and ask the question, is there an end in sight? I want to start with a little bit of a twist on that question. Um, gridlock isn't new. In fact, it's been around since the founding fathers actually uh, uh, designed our system of governance. And I, uh, it, I believe there's many who argue that it was designed to cause a little gridlock now and then in order to prevent laws from being passed too easily or prevent the rule of the majority from stepping on the rights of the minority. So let me ask you first, do you think gridlock is an aberration in American democracy, or is it just the way we do business? Let's start with you. Well, it's the way we've done business. I mean, James Madison's idea was to draft a constitution, and our founders believed the same thing, that would frustrate a tyrant or a dictator coming in and being able to move too quickly to the left or too quickly to the right. And that's worked. Uh, it's worked. You know, I mean, it, case that we have a civil war and we have canings on the house floor and things like that. But for the most part, it's worked. Um, and everybody's always been unhappy. Uh, but you look back and you see the results and it's positive. Things have changed though. I, you, you talked about when I came in in 1994 and boy, there was gridlock then. Um, and we didn't like each other. I mean, I could not stand Bill Clinton. I loathed him. I mean, he'd be like, I feel your pain. I'd be like, he's lying. You know he's lying. And he hated me, too. I remember telling his chief of staff, Erskine Bowles, he said, how you doing, Joe? I said, I'm doing fine, Erskine, but I got to admit, I just hate your boss. I feel really bad about it. I'm a Southern Baptist. I feel guilty. He said, don't worry about it, Joe. He hates you, too. <laughs> And he did. But you should see them now. Oh, stop it. It's gross. It's not gross. <laughs> Get a room. Oh, stop. Oh, Mr. President, you're the greatest president that ever was. Oh, Joe, you have the best TV show that I've ever seen. How great is my hair? It's not as good as your hair. Have changed. Let's look in the mirror now. Aren't we great? Oh, yes. Yeah. Future Republican I... primary voters, cover your ears. This is a lie. It's disgusting. They but, are you know, all over okay, each other. Okay, but here's my point. There's a though. point to it. There is a point. And the point is that even though we had a Democratic president that hated a Republican Congress, and hate is not too strong of a <laughs> word, and a Republican Congress that loathed a Democratic president, think about what we did together. We balanced the budget for the first time in a generation. We balanced it four years in a row for the first time since the 1920s. Passed welfare reform regulatory reform, capital gains, tax cuts, and again, balance the budget, actually paid down the debt for a few years. And okay, so there was impeachment, but it was the 90s, it seemed like the thing to do. But for the most part, we got great things done. And you know, we, we talk about- Despite it. Despite it. We talk about Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan as well. Chris Matthews has written a book about that. Think about what they did together. And they had, a, they had a rule, and Tip was very clear about it, and Richard Reeves wrote about this in his biography on Reagan. And the rule was they fought like hell all day, 
But at 6 o'clock at night, they became friends. And they, they really did. You know, Tip O'Neill's son said the only thing his dad hated more than Ronald Reagan's philosophy was gridlock and getting nothing done. And so there was that healthy respect that's missing in Washington today. So wait, so, wh so when is gridlock a good thing and when is it a bad thing? Well, gridlock is necessary. I mean, that friction, it's called separation of powers, and I think it's always a good thing. I mean, we see, I mean, I personally, I, I don't think monopolies in Washington are a good thing. You look, Democrats had a monopoly in 93 and 94. They went too far left. People elected people like me because of it in 94. You don't want that happening. Um, Republicans <laughs> had a gridlock in Washington, D.C. under George W. Bush. Think about what happened over those six to eight years. Gridlock is good as long as you have two sides that are working together constructively in the best interest of the country. Something's been lost. And Mika, your, your dad, when... and. Professor Schwarzenegger was talking about meeting your dad in the White House, but your dad... He didn't insult you, did he? No, no he was wonderful. Mm. Uh, we both had an accent, so that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, he had something well, in he, common. Well, if he he did, insulted he, Joe. Yeah, he insulted me. He said, you know, you are stunningly superficial. But anyway, <laughs> um, but your dad, though, I mean, just the makeup of, of your dad's staff shows how different things were not so long ago. Well, there are certainly components to gridlock that help the process along, and I think some of those key components that may seem ancillary or on the side are far more important than maybe we thought. And that is sort of the joy of the process. That drink between the speaker and the president is, is because they just so enjoyed the process. Whether they hated each other during the day, there was something about being there and serving and a responsibility to country. And I would take it further and say that the joy involves also families mixing together and opposing sides socializing and their children meeting. And all those things happened all the time when I was growing up in Washington. I mean, you know, my dad didn't do a lot of deals like with on Capitol Hill as a senator or, but there are there were certain negotiations and policies involved with what he did and if anyone had my mother's roadkill at his house he, he they usually had a hand over him in terms of what they were and there were lots of funny joyful things that were batted around because the families interacted and the staff I mean, oh my lord my dad's staff and was and you know I didn't notice this till so many years later we threw a 80th birthday party for him. He's 87 now, which is unbelievable. Um, he gets meaner by the day. Yeah. You think it's not possible. Oh, no. He just gets Stronger. more honest, Joe. He's good, yeah. More honest. Yeah. Um, but his staff, uh, the NSC threw the party and the family was there. It was Condoleezza Rice, Madeleine Albright, General Odom, uh, Bob Gates. These are the guys and women who worked for him on both sides of the aisle who've become the greats. But worked for him because he wanted to be challenged. And, you know, then you look at the media, and there's a whole section of the media where nobody wants to be challenged anymore. They just go to their corners. All these things are components of gridlock being a bad thing instead of a good thing. Well, Governor, when you and I were working in Sacramento together, you actually, I watched you use gridlock as the mechanism by which to get Democrats to compromise and Republicans to compromise, and both sides did things that they swore they would never do when they rose their hand and took their oath of office. You used gridlock in order to get major welfare reform, cuts in spending. You even used gridlock to get the very open primary on the ballot that we're discussing a part here today. Could you have done that without gridlock, and how did you get through it? Well, first of all, I, I, I believe also that you have to have sometimes gridlock, but it depends also how long. How long do you want to go on? I mean, what is going on in the United States right now, I mean, I think we had enough. Right. I mean, I think there's nothing getting done. Nothing. For years and years and years, you cannot point at anything that was accomplished in Washington, and we're spending two and a half billion dollars every year on the Capitol and all of those people that work there for nothing. And, you know, not the immigration reform, not the really good health care reform. Uh, you know, the budget is in a shamble. One more debt is, is adding up. I mean, all this stuff, you know, energy policy and all this. I mean, where are we going? So I think it's enough of the gridlock. I cannot call that gridlock any more positive or constructive. Uh, I think we had temporary gridlock in California, and you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, especially when it came to the budget. 
I mean, you can imagine a Republican governor and the Democratic legislature. Uh, I mean, you know, there was, we, we all of a sudden were in a recession in 2007, and they wanted to continue spending. So, of course, they wouldn't sign the budget. So there was, you know, a standoff, and they went on and dragged out until actually beginning of October when we finally signed the budget. But in return then, we got all kinds of concessions, uh, which was great. So we used the, 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 you know, the gridlock to our advantage, and the rainy day fund and, and all kinds of reforms. And uh, so I think on the end, it is important to work together. And I have to just go back to what you guys said about hating. There was no one in Sacramento that I hated. I mean, these were all people that worked really hard, and they just had a different philosophy than I had. So it doesn't mean like, uh, you know, Speaker Nunez, he became a very good friend of mine. John Burton, the senator, became a very good friend and kind of a mentor to me because he was a terrific guy. He just was a liberal. Yes. So, so what? I mean, it's like, okay, so that's his belief. Mine was to be more conservative, and then we had to sit down and work it out. And we did the reform, as you know, with workers' compensation that saved the state now $150 billion, the businesses. So we worked things out and we worked on things together, even though he had a different belief. But it doesn't mean that I have to hate him. I looked at him and I said, he's a great guy. I want to hang out with this guy. He was funny. And uh, so oh, with, uh, with uh, Antonio here, I mean, he's a Democrat. I mean, we hung out together. We were going to barbecues. We were, uh, you know, having a good time, and 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 uh, we were good friends. And he called me anytime when he needed something, and I called him when I needed uh, something from him. Okay, but here's the problem. Bob, Bob Hertz, governor, was sitting here. He was one of my advisors when I ran for <laughs> he's governor. Wall, right? and he's a Democrat. He's a Democrat. Sort of seems I like mean, Joe. So I mean, it's a, to me, <laughs> to me, governor, I don't see it that way. But look, you know, look so at him. Look at way. him. Look at her. Yeah. Right. I want to hang out with them too. Yeah. Do right. you want to hang out with anybody in Washington? Because I don't. You want to go I've out? tried. Me, me, I thought, no, I thought we you hung were gonna... out with the president. He, he's like, six o'clock, got to go. No. I mean, what's that? I was just like, I said, we, bring up Mitch we were the last No, year. Mitch McConnell. We were last year in Washington. <laughs> We oh my God! We had a good time there yeah. with the legislator. So I think that uh, yeah. You, what has changed? You, 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 you know, though, I, I wanted to follow up though on on what the governor said. I say hate. Hate's a strong word. Just dislike. it's a terrible word. It's a terrible word. Um, but you know, Bill. No, before Clinton, you my, say my, it, it sounds like a strong word, but it's true. <laughs> now you say it's a strong word. It's not true. Hey. So which one is it? You know what? It's how you say you it. You know what? Just 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 work with me here, baby. All I'm right. right. <laughs> All right, all right, I'm so, working the audience. Right. I'll work the audience the way I want to work the audience. Job. You work the way you want to work the audience, okay? You did great so, job. thank you so much. I'm yeah. going to tap dance in a second. So, uh, it, reminds me, it, it, it reminds me of what my... Sit in between you like two. this? Yeah. Would you Joe? like it? Someone in Bavaria is sit over here. The table all, all right. so, 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 anyway. You guys want to be so, a dear, a dear personal friend of mine, Bill Clinton, once oh. told me. <laughs> um, it reminds... You know, he, he actually said we were talking about some of the problems in Washington. And Bill Clinton said, and I agree completely, and, I, and it was actually my approach too, being in government, getting things done, requires that you have no memory. Uh, you really don't. I mean, it's like people that sit back, and there are a lot of politicians that keep score. Why? Yeah. You know, because the thing is, you, you really could impeach Bill Clinton in the morning, and in the afternoon, he'd call you and go, Hey, you want to go golf? I mean, because he always knew there was always the next vote. I had people supporting me that got so angry because the very people that during the campaign were spreading lies and all these 30-second commercials, after I won, they were the first people I called. And the reason why is, it, you know, do you want to be right or do you want to get things done? And, and a lot of people in Washington, D.C., uh, unfortunately, have, have memories that are far too long. It, it's, it, 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 it requires a balancing act that right now, I think in Washington, D.C., we don't see because, quite frankly, there are a lot of amateurs there. I want to really quickly talk, though, about you two. And the reason I want to talk about you two is because for a Republican governor yeah. to have a Democratic chief of staff that worked for the preceding Democratic governor, I actually think that's the model. I remember people came in and said, oh, you need a conservative this to run your military conservative. I said, no, I don't. I already know what I believe. Mm -hmm. Bring in the best people you can bring in and we'll debate. I mean, talk about, if you don't mind, if I can turn this on you, talk about how important it is to have a leader that's confident enough in his or her own beliefs 
that they don't want a yes man or a yes woman. And was there ever a moment where you really hated what you had to do? With this governor? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've worked for two governors. <laughs> oh. Okay. We'll get to that and one so in a moment. so now you know why we aren't at the Great Avis Institute of Politics. Go ahead. No. I mean, I've, I've been through 10 years in politics in the governor's office, and in that time, you know, there, there's always things that, you know, you, you, you do what you have to do, and if you're a staff person, that's what makes, that's what makes a good staff person. I'm not the one elected to office. Uh, so um, it's really about trust and having the kind of relationship where, you know, did he compromise his values in, in any way? No. So if it's a tactical issue... You just, you know, we have our arguments behind closed doors, and when, when I open that door, my job is, he's, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, I build the planes, he's the pilot. Right. And so, there, as long as you have that relationship worked out, then I don't, it's, it's not an issue. A lot of what doesn't happen today is people think that when they wear a label, the Democrat or Republican label, that it means they're not even allowed to get along with the other team. No. They can't even, right. and, and every every Democrat I know after they left office talked about how how right the the other party was when they uh, you know, but they couldn't say it when they were actually in office. And most of the staff people I've, that are my counterparts wouldn't ever think about working for for the other team because you get blacklisted. You can't even you mm. can't. It ends your yeah. political career. Yeah. So and I, I didn't I didn't care at that point in time. So. But it was a, it was really interesting because when I appointed her. Immediately, uh, the Republican Party of California called for a meeting. <laughs> I remember it was across the street at the hotel, and yeah. we met there. And they immediately said to me, this is, you got to get rid of her. Otherwise, we would never meet again, and this is disastrous, and uh, you, know, you cannot do that. And so I said to them, I said, well, wait a minute, as far as I remember, I said, correct me if I'm wrong, I said, uh, but it is the governor that picks his chief of staff, not right. the Republican Party. Right. And they said, hey, you're right. I said, well, then just relax now, okay? So it's just, uh, <laughs> let's just forget about that kind of a complaint but because I'm going to keep her. And, you know, there was the suspicion for the first half year and everything. But then as time went on, they felt very comfortable. And actually they loved coming down to our smoking tent which we had in the middle of the atrium of the Capitol because there was nowhere else that you were allowed to smoke. And I had to have my stogie during the day, so we built a smoking tent. And then we found out, of course, that all the legislators that smoked wanted to come down, Democrats and Republicans, yeah. and use their tent. But, I mean, they all came down, felt very comfortable with, with negotiating with her and trusted her and, uh, because they realized very quickly that Susan was uh, about one thing, and that is to make it work for the people and not to cater to the Democratic Party, she didn't owe anything to them, or to the Republican Party, it didn't matter. She wanted to see what is best, and mm -hmm. she would do all the research for me and everything, but we always tried to do what was best for the people. And not that I was always right, this was right, just right. my belief what was best for the people, but that's, that's the way we worked, and that's why we were uh, actually a very good team. And you have to remember the Republicans also, when you said, you know, I'm, I'm bipartisan, they said, that's not bipartisan, that's bipolar. That's what they called me. That's yes. right. Yeah. Yes, and it was. All, they and they loved the smoking tent until they realized that our cigar smoke was going into the right into the intake valves for the air conditioning system <laughs> on the second floor. So. But but that you know bipolar actually is a better term, actually than partisanship. We were talking about partisanship and gridlock. Gridlock is bad, but having that creative friction rubbing against each other all the time. Meant. That is the genius was, of American government. It was the most nonpartisan atmosphere I've ever worked in in my life. I sat there next to, he hired people who were as far right on the political spectrum as you yeah. could and on the far left of the political spectrum. And we mm. had debates That's about great. issues where you could literally tap into the other perspective right there at the table without, without positioning. We actually explored issues from various perspectives. And it, it, it it was the best political atmosphere you could have. And you get blindsided what has a lot less. today. You talked to me, you said no. things have changed. Right. Why is it different today? Gridlock has been around since the country was founded. They've, we've, we've, right. we've survived it. We've used it. Why, well, what you, has you, changed? You got it right. I mean, you guys got it right out here in what you all did with Common Cause and the League of Women Voters, what you did on, on, on redistricting. That's what's changed. I mean, the fact is that, you, that in Washington right now, you're right. They've got a 9% approval rating. Uh, and yet, you know, I think the turnover rate in the Politburo in the old Soviet Union was higher than it is right now in Congress. And that's because we have a political system, just like 
cable news in prime time that encourages extremism. Everybody runs to their corners. That's the big part of the change. Everybody runs to their corners. Everybody, it, 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 they live in this, this echo chamber. And at the end of the day, your political opponent is not wrong. Your political opponent's actually not somebody you can learn from. Your political opponent is the enemy. So what, what is it that, ca that causes them to run into their corners? What's the, what's the relationship between the gerrymandering It's self-interest. Uh, it's self-interest. If you, it, it, you actually get rewarded for being extreme when you go home back in your district. The government shut down, Meek. We talked about this a lot. People, you know, Ted Cruz and a lot of members of Congress shut down the government, not because it was bad for them politically, but because everybody cheered when they went back home, right? This media angle that you mentioned, I think, has really exploded what was right about what might have been working in the past, because not only do they run to their corners, and you ask why, so they can play to their base. I think, it, look at the Republican primary candidates we got last time around. How many people in this room were excited about Mitt Romney? Exactly. Um, you know, if you were all Republicans, it would like be the Mitt. same answer. Yeah. No, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. Um. The, the, and, and they were all, you know, they were all base players. And um, it wasn't serious. But even more so, it it's happens on the left and the right. Um, they go to one network or the other. There's no place in the middle that really sort of calls into question the, the playing to the base. And by the way, just for the record, when we only had the three networks really delivering the TV news and the major newspapers, that created its own set of problems, too. That wasn't perfect. There was definitely liberal media bias and um, a lot of people working at these organizations that had the same background, the same school background, the same everything and lived in the same places and went, all went to the same Ivies and they all had the same lead story every night and the same kicker, which I never really understood because that was supposed to be a quirky story that you found somewhere and yet they'd all do the same one, really? So they all thought alike. Um, and now, though, it's frightening. I mean, we had a problem um, really trying to criticize our own, the, the, you know, you don't bite the hand that feeds you, or the enemy as well, because they may attack you more. But I think we were really confronting a problem in the time that Gabby Gifford was shot. And I, th I think what we saw was hatred flying around the airwaves and even being incited by some people. And that, that, that's because it's there now, these, these different corners that are so ideologically driven. But I, I think that, that here's the important thing, and that is, that's what this symposium is all about. Right. Because instead of just sitting there and complaining all the time, I think we should do something about it. And I think in California, we did something about it. We saw the gridlock too many times. We saw the things that didn't work. <laughs> and we went out and we attacked the problem by saying, OK, first of all, we have to recognize that in America, the political system is fixed. I mean, for 200 years or so, we had you know, the gerrymandering. And the, the, the politicians drew the district lines that absolutely made no sense, except for them it made sense because it kept them in power. There was no competition. So the incumbent was always voted back in. I mean, if you think about it, that in California, in 10 years, there was like uh, 314 congressional and legislative uh, races. And only one changed party hand in yeah. 10 years. Mm. Out of 314 races, only one changed party hands. After we did the redistricting in the open primary, in one year, seven of them changed hands. In one election cycle, seven of them changed hands. So just think about that we can do something about it. Now the question is, in California, we have already seen, and you will hear a report about that later on, about what changes have taken place when it comes to voting. Even mm -hmm. though now there is a clear majority amongst the Democrats in California, they have the super majority, but their voting record has improved tremendously because of that. And this is what is so important. And I think what we should do is look at the United States and recognize that there are uh, 24 states that have an initiative process where we could go, and this is why Common Cause is here, and this is why we need all those good government advocate groups to come together uh, if there's the League of Women Voters or if it's the AARP and so forth, come together and go and look at the America and see where we can create changes because I tell you, every time we create a little change, it could have a great effect 
in Washington. So they finally get things done. What's the connection between the, the gerrymandered district and what Mika was talking about in terms of having them run and play to their base? Why is that, why is that connected to the gridlock problem we have? Well, it's connected to the gridlock problem because if you actually work with somebody on the other side of the aisle, I, we, were, we actually were giving a speech in Pennsylvania uh, and Ed Rindell was there during the debate. And Ed and I had two very different views on how the healthcare system should have been reformed. And somebody asked us, why can't it get done? And Ed said, and he was right, he said, you know, Joe and I disagree on so much, but if we went in the back room and we talked for three hours, I would give him what, what he needed as far as market forces driving health care reform. He would give me what I needed as far as safety net issues so I could go back to my base. And we could get the outlines of a deal pretty quickly. He said, but if we did that now, five minutes after I went in there, there would be a liberal blogger killing me. The calls would start streaming into my office. A conservative talk show host would be killing him. Calls would start going into his office. Panic would ensue. And pretty soon, the talks would collapse. And we could get nobody else supporting us. And the most important I think part of that story is, especially for students, because we've talked about the problems with this, this, this divide, it's a mirage. It is a complete mirage. And I say that as somebody that has been, Meek and I have given four, 500 speeches over the past six years. We've had like, God knows how many book tours. It's like Emerald. We have a book every three days. Is it? We give, when we just give a policy speech, the same speech at Pat Robertson's University in rural Virginia as we do at the 92nd Street Y on the Upper West Side. It's stunning. People applaud at the same lines. They laugh at the same jokes. They, there's not this great divide. I mean, most of them- Speaking to the, one of the conventions. What's that? One of the party conventions, the speeches have to change a little bit. Well, they change, they change a little bit, but I'm, I'm just saying that you actually, whether it's a primetime cable news, whether it's talk radio, whether it's gerrymandered districts, we have a political system that actually creates a false divide that's not really there. And we're not being Pollyannish. We're really not. I mean, most Americans know, uh, you know, we've, We've got, to get, we've got to get good jobs back to this country. We've got to stop spending $2 billion a week in Afghanistan fighting an endless war. We need to invest in education, R&D, infrastructure. Uh, we have to take care of long-term uh, entitlement problems, whether it's Medicare or Medicaid. You can go on and on and on and on. Um, and yet Washington and a lot of political systems Get in the way of that. It is a false divide. And that's why these ideas are so potent. If you can just break through the partisan gridlock, I think most Americans will, will endorse them. Well, I just want to tell you that you know, I went through some of the same things when I was governor, where you know, there were the threats from the Republican Party or the threats from the Democratic Party and all of this. But we marched forward mm -hmm. because I didn't care if I fail. And if I didn't care if I failed with the initiatives, and as you know, I wiped out in 2005 with all the initiatives, it didn't matter. Because I come from the sports background. In lifting, the only way you can go up with the lift is if you're willing to risk that you fail. The only way I know that I can lift more than 500 pounds is if I drive 5, 10 and fail. And I did f fail uh, many, many times. But the next, there was one time. Do you think if I tried to lift 500 pounds, 500? I'd fail? Never. You're perfect. I can't. <laughs> I think no, but I mean, it's like everyone yeah. is just scared of failing. Right. So what? I mean, this is why I mentioned earlier what happened in the Ukraine. People died there, but look what they got. Amazing they got story. their freedom back. They are, oh, they were around the, the presidential palace. They're now sitting in a house where they vote and they, they, they make decisions now and they move forward as long as the Russians don't interfere. Oh, they're but, going to. Yeah, so we don't know. But I mean, <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is, that's what you need to do. If you want to accomplish great things, but you're always afraid of failing, you are not going to be successful. I can tell you that any business leader, 
anyone out there can tell you that if you're worried about failing or that maybe you're not going to make as much money as you planned or any of the, you're not going to make it. Right. It's as simple as that Something and definitely that not in sports. So this is why I say we have to be courageous. We have to go out and do it. The Republican Party beat me up many times and they said, don't work with sales and don't do this. Don't ever touch the environmental issues, you know, and blah, blah. Hey, what I care. I mean, to me, it was very clear that you got to protect the environment, you got to stay with the tradition of California, and that's why California is 40% more energy efficient than the rest of the country, because we always marched forward in the right direction and protected the environment and were for conservation and all of those things. So, of course, I fought for that. That's what the people wanted. You didn't look at it as a Republican philosophy or as a Democratic philosophy. It was the right thing for the people. True story. Everyone at NBC told me not to work with Joe. Literally, stay away from him. He's a conservative. He's, smart. He's yeah. What's the deal with him? And don't do it. And I didn't care because I saw a winner. And uh, there's actually a point to what you both said about what to do about this beyond voting, um, which everybody should do. And it is incredible this right we have. I, I so agree with you. But what you're looking at here on stage are two visionaries. What you did in this state and the fearlessness that you had to bring to the table in order to cut through some of the problems that most politicians can't cut through. And, you know, Joe, what's wrong with the media? There are not enough shows like ours. He created this show. He went into Phil with a big poster board, that's our boss, and this is when Don Imus cleared the decks and there were three hours to fill on MSNBC, lean left, and he went in there and said, let's do long interviews with interesting people and get really smart people on the show. And I think Phil at that point said, I don't see any ratings there, but give it a try. And our show happened because we took a chance. Joe created a platform that you don't see on television. You see right, you see left, or you see this mushy middle uh, of, a, of veiled, veiled objectivity on the networks in the morning. That's if they're not doing bras for spring. And so it was a huge leap. We had everything to lose, no job, no job. <laughs> and we didn't care. Um, but that's what you have to be. Number one, a visionary. Number two, not afraid. And number three, ready to fail. Um, when uh, the governor says vote, please vote, absolutely. But I would say run. If you're in this room, you're interested in what we're talking about. And we need you not just voting, we need you thinking about serving because we have a very bad batch in Washington right now because part of it are, is the quality of the leaders in Washington. And while we're talking about visionaries, Herb is in the second row. How many students do we have here? If you haven't signed up for Obamacare yet, he's going to be waiting at the oh, door. Oh, come on. <laughs> Seriously? Here, Herb is in the purple glasses. Stand she up, Herb. She can't help herself. He's here to explain it to you. It's so easy, and you need to sign up. Hey, Herb, why don't, why don't you go back to Arizona, Herb? Okay. Uh, he's going right. to wait for you, and he's, it's so easy. Zero. Oh, oh, I'm not going to say anything. Oh, my <laughs> Lord. I'm going to let you take the fall. <laughs> it's important that so, the young wait, people yeah, sign up. By the way, while you we're guys, talking to the audience, where's the law school right? dean? Is the law school dean here? <laughs> All right. Hey, listen, I, I tried to apply back in 1987. <laughs> It you didn't made work. a terrible mistake. It didn't mistake. work out. Could I reapply? I mean, I, I went to Florida law school. It's okay, but it ain't USC. You need no. health care, everybody. So you all, you all are raising something that, that is kind of dancing around the issue of leadership. I mean, right. if, you, you can, if you change the structure of the electoral process as we did, we, we did the open primary and the redistricting reform, that should at least change the math that affects how people campaign. But... What hap I mean, how important uh, is it that you have leaders that are willing to use the political process, use gridlock, in order to break through it? The governor said something uh, outside uh, when we were talking before the reception. Uh, unfortunately, I went to University of Alabama undergrad, so no, I don't remember exactly what he said. Um, <laughs> I can't even remember anything. Don't even know how to count there. We're not good at math at Alabama. <laughs> but we don't have to be because most years we only have to count to number one. Roll Tide! Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so... But the governor said something that really struck a chord with me, and that was that political courage actually isn't risky. I'm not exactly sure what you, how you said it. It's not but political suicide. It's not political suicide. I would even say showing political courage, just in a calculated sort of way, isn't even courageous. Because people hunger for courage so much that it always pays off. I go back over my political career. 
The only times I ever got in trouble was when I sat there and tried to calculate like Frank Underwood. I did it like once or twice and it blew up in my face when I did what I knew what was right. Even when people disagreed with me, they would see me in the airports and they'd go, I think you're crazy, but I know, I, I know you're fighting for us and you believe in what you're doing and I'm voting for you because I know that your heart's in the right place. People see that and they're so hungry for that sort of leadership now, especially in Washington, because everybody seems to be scared of their own shadow. Right. Okay, uh, Speaker Boehner tried to uh, negotiate with the Obama administration not long ago, and Eric Cantor and his lieutenants cut his legs out from under him. So the leader tries to cooperate, tries to compromise, tries to work with the leadership, and the, the and his own lieutenants. Got okay, so but, what went wrong there? Don't well, I mean, that. I mean, who who's in charge? It's just like when the Republican leaders went to the governor and said he shouldn't hire you. The governor had two responses. He could have been milly mouth, or he could have said, hey, guess what? Last time I checked, the governor picks their chief of staff. Why don't you guys go out and have a nice cocktail party on a, on a country club golf course, and I'll do my job? You know, John Boehner, I've been saying it for several years, John's got a decision to make. Either he's Speaker of the House, and he runs the House, or he moves like to Monterey, and he golfs at Pebble Beach for the rest of his life. And I'm dead serious. Why would you want to be Speaker of the House if you're afraid of your lieutenants? If you're afraid of your own shadow? And what John Boehner would find is what we're talking about. Show that political courage and say, hey, guys, you voted me in your Speaker. I'm not going to shut down the government. I'm not going to let you guys kill yourself. I'm not going to, you know, you put your hands on the hot stove enough. And if you don't like that, vote me out. I'll be glad to have a press conference. You know, be glad to tell them why I'm leaving. So let's switch to uh, when George Bush the, uh, the second was in office. That was arguably one of the most hyper-partisan atmospheres in history. I mean, the election was, uh, uh, he lost the popular vote. He barely eked out a victory in 2004. The Senate's divided 50-50, loses both houses to the Democrats. And yet, at, during that time, no child left behind. Medicare Part D, among the sweeping social legislation passed since 1965. Bush's tax cuts in 2001, 2003, 2004, together the largest tax cuts in American history. The McCain-Feingold, Sarbanes-Oxley, biggest reforms in decades, some of them over the stiff opposition of Republicans. How did he do that? By the way, and my favorite, the surge, when he decided to go for the surge in December of 06, his approval ratings were, what, 25%? I saw an LA Times poll that had 78% of Americans were against the surge. I'm not, a, you know, I, as a conservative, I had a lot of problems with George W. With Bush, but you know what? George W. Bush, he did it anyway. I was talking to Nicole Wallace, who I don't know if I should say this, uh, Nicola, good Californian, but Nicola to told me last week, she said, she said, I know you got problems with George Bush. I said, but let me tell you why you'd love him. Because if he met Keith Oberman tomorrow, who, you know, because Keith just killed Bush every night, it turned to go, I loved you on Sports Center. <laughs> How's Dan Patrick? Because he had short no memory. idea who Keith Oberman was, Very other than memory. like he didn't he didn't watch prime time. I tell you, Barack Obama can say what Barack Obama wants to say in the White House. They're obsessed with that stuff. And and I, I'm still trying to figure out how George W. Bush got done what George W. Bush got done. And again, not a big fan of a lot of the stuff he did. Barack Obama had like 59 senators and a majority in 09 and 10 and has had a lot more of an advantage than George W. Bush. What have we got, what have we what, got is done? This, is this a tactical issue? Is it a personality issue? What are the differences between the two, the, those two administrations and their ability to get things done in a Congress where they don't have a majority? Well, I don't want to sound partisan. Uh, but I guess I can, because I, again, I, I'm not a huge fan of what George W. Bush did over eight years. But Barack Obama's an amateur. He doesn't know how to work Washington. Mm. He doesn't know. And by the way, all of these Republican freshman senators that think they're ready to be president of the United States that just got to Washington, D.C., whether you're talking about Marco, who I like, or Ted Cruz, or Rand Paul, these guys are all amateurs, too. They're not ready for prime time. I think you, she's recording you. It's going to be played no, back on YouTube. I would never. No, but, 
<laughs> but the thing is, you know, we went in and we spoke with the president for about an hour, hour and a half oh, God. before the election. That was off the record. Do you know what that means? It, yeah, it means that, okay, so we were talking to this private. guy in Washington. And Mika asked him, why don't you have oh, more God. Republicans and their families over to your you house? Share your conversation. This guy lives in a big house. Uh, to your house <laughs> and, and do do what they used to do in Washington. He said, well, you know, I don't, I don't need to socialize. And really, I work till 6 o'clock. And then I go upstairs and hang out with my kids. So Really? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I, you, you got to work it, man. you no, got to yeah, work I, it. Absolutely. He's absolutely right, because relationships are so important. And I remember that I took the legislative leaders in uh, and we flew around with the with the chat. We, we took them to Washington to our meetings, to the governor's meeting, met, meet with the legislators back there to get more federal money for our state and all of this stuff. We had them over at the house, at the Christmas parties, uh, the smoking tent. Uh, I remember even when Tony Blair was in town talking to me about the environment because we wanted to do the cap and trade and the re reducing our greenhouse gases and they've done it successfully in Europe. And uh, I took uh, Speaker Nunez with me uh, even though he wasn't even invited to that meeting, I took him. He was a Democrat. He was the Democratic leader because I knew that I needed to go and work with him to get the environmental uh, you know, agenda all accomplished, to go and reduce the tailpipe emissions, to have the Million Solar Roof Initiative, to have the Green Building Initiative, to reduce the, our greenhouse gases by 25% by the year 2020, and all of those kind of things. So relationships, I needed him. relationships. I needed relationships, him, exactly. Yeah. And so therefore, I took him to the meeting. He appreciated it tremendously. He learned a lot about the history of the cap and trade, the way it works in Europe, the mistakes they've made, the good side of it. And this is how we crafted together the legislation. And it's all about relationships. John Burton, I used to hang out with him. We talked about he was a big fan of Austria and Germany and traveled uh, around uh, you know, those countries right after the Second World War. And uh, you know, read all the books over there, knew the, uh, the authors of the, uh, it was a big fan of the music from over there, everything. He just loved all that. So I worked with him and I, I, I hung out with him. You need to build relationships. This is extremely important and the day Everything is done on the internet and everyone is texting and everything. There's no more personal kind of relationships. Legislators go and leave Washington on Thursday afternoon. They're gone, so they're not hanging out together anymore like in the old days. It's one of the biggest complaints. Oh, so, yeah. it, 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 and that makes a huge difference in, in Washington where on the weekends, families used to hang out together. Kids would go to school with each other instead of back in the districts. And that made, it, that made a huge difference. But you know, you'll have a lot of people now that will be very cynical about relationships actually mattering. Uh, you, I go back to the Reagan biography that Richard Reeves wrote. He said after uh, the Beirut bombing in 1983, Reagan said it was the low point of his presidency, the worst day of his presidency. Um, Tip O'Neill called Democrats all together when the word spread that Sunday morning. I'm sure a lot of people remember it. And all the Democrats went in, and they thought that Tip O'Neill was going to be telling them strategy about how to, to talk as a unified Democratic caucus. They all get in front of him, and O'Neill said, today we're not Democrats. Today we're Americans. And if any of you have anything to say about our commander-in-chief without passing it by me first, you won't have Ronnie Reagan to answer to. You'll have Tip O'Neill to answer to. And you don't want to have me to answer to. And Richard Reeves wrote that, sure enough, the Democrats held their tongue. The nation mourned. We had a unified front to our enemies that had killed over 240 Marines. And a couple of weeks later, Tip and Reagan got on the phone, said, OK, we're ready. Let's have the debate. And they moved forward, and they had the debate. That would have never happened if they didn't have the type of relationship that the governor's talking about. And all these people who think that, that, uh, that it, it doesn't matter, that you've got a president that's constantly working House members and Senate members, just doesn't know how Washington works. Business doesn't work that way. Academia doesn't work that way. No, absolutely not. But uh, let me tell you, there's one guy that had the huge challenge, and it was uh, you know, our mayor, Antonio Villaraigosa, because he was a Democrat, 
But in order to make the city of Los Angeles successful, you have to work with Republicans and especially with the business community. Do you want to share a little bit of that challenge that you had? You like Let me thank you, Governor. I, we, we did have a great relationship. We worked together on uh, you know, a broad range of issues. And this is the second time I've uh, actually attended something like this. You, me, and Bloomberg at Getty House, what, six years ago, did uh, Beyond Partisanship, if you remember. And mm -hmm. I think both of us, uh, in our role, respective roles as chief executives, have, have just gotten tired of, of the ideologues, frankly. And actually, I, I think that Joe said something about the country, and I think that's true. The, 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 there's a big middle in the country okay. where there's not a big divide. But the parties, ideologically, the divide is bigger than oh, yeah. any time I can remember. And, and it's part of why it is so um, gridlocked and, and, and the like. And, and it's hyper-partisan uh, because of that. What, one of the reasons for your success is you were a centrist. I mean, you were center-right, but you, know, you were a centrist. And, and there were Democrats who were willing to move the ball ahead. You know, all, those of us who played a little ball know, you know, you, you, four yards and you Alabama, right? Right. Four. Well, sometimes seven, eight, yeah. 12, 15. <laughs> but, you know, and, and then you get a first down and yeah. then you get a touchdown. And, and there's this notion today that uh, somehow that incremental change is, is a bad word. And you were very focused on, you know, getting half a loaf. And that was the key, I think, to your success. And, and in my own city, I mean, we had to take on things like pension reform because I wasn't mm. going to go bankrupt. Uh, and we challenged our employees. Uh, we challenged uh, the issue of seniority and tenure in education. So, you know, I, I think part of our problem today is that it's very broken on the right, and I think a little more broken on the right, but broken on the left too. N the courage that you spoke about, neither, uh, neither party, uh, leaders in, in both parties are unwilling to challenge their own constituencies, unwilling to say, hey, there's a middle ground here. I mean, look at, uh, what was it? Six years ago, you all tried to do universal health care. And the left, I love them, they're good friends, they wanted uh, single payer. And they killed your uh, bill, which would have been a great bill for California six years before uh, Obamacare. Um, but they, they, they let the perfect get in the way of the good. So there's too much of that going on, I think. Uh, you and I as chief executives in the time that we, you know, we had to, I tell people, you, you get radicalized when you have to sign the check on the front, uh, not just the back, you know, it's yeah. easy to sign it on the back. Uh, you, you, ha you realize you have to balance a budget, uh, you know, the little difference between the state and the, you guys used to balance your budget on, on us. Oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. But that was Democrat and Republican, hey, by hey, the way. Get over here and take the money right. faster, you're yeah. fired. So... <laughs> He's right. So, yeah. Yeah, he's right. <laughs> no, he knows I'm right. I used to be speaker of the assembly, too. So finally, yeah. let me just say this. I think there are, I, I want to get to a question, because I think there are areas where we should be able to work. Cause you, and you mentioned some of them, Joe. Infrastructure huh. and transportation. I mean, like, those weren't partisan issues before. They, they used to have, like, an automatic vote, Democrat and Republican, uh, to pass the surface transportation bill. Right. Uh, you know, education. I mean, look, folks, we're not competing with the developing world when you, when you look at the issue of education. Uh, th that ought to be an area where there's bipartisan support. Uh, you know. Well, and, and there is, and that, that huge divide, whether you talk about education, or you talk about R&D, or you talk about infrastructure. And let me tell you, we're talking about energy here. Guess what? The president's right. It's an all of the above approach on energy. There are a lot of people on the left that aren't gonna love the energy revolution that's coming, that's gonna revitalize America's manufacturing base and do extraordinary things. But guess what? There aren't a lot of people on the right that are gonna see us using a lot of that money to actually invest in clean energy. That's right. And God, let's hope a clean nationwide grid. I mean, the thing is, most of Americans really are between the, the you know, yeah, in the 80 yards, between the 20 yard lines on both sides, as we and continue to torture football metaphors here. And as um, an example, yeah. you know, when I took LA, uh, we signed agreements to get completely off of coal by 2025. 
It's going to be the only American city completely off of coal by 2025. Sign the agreements. The first question from some of my friends on the left was, are, what are you going to replace it with? Well, we're expanding renewables. We're going to be at 35 uh, to 40 percent by 2025. 20, uh, uh, but we also fracking right. and, uh, to get for natural gas. And the left, uh, you know, it attacked us because they said you're you're fracking. There's there's an unwillingness to find a middle ground, and that's a perfect example yeah. of a of a middle ground. You know, Canada's been fracking for. How many decades, and 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 have done it uh, fairly successfully. So uh, I just want to thank you, uh, Governor. Uh, we did work well together. Uh, I think we do need to have this conversation. I think there was an impact on both initiatives in terms of you know m moderating uh, the the center, if you will. You're seeing more and more Republicans in California now finally in support of uh, immigration reform. Mm -hmm. That's like, I mean, that was something that you never would have seen. You're seeing Democrats who are supporting pro-business uh, legislation and balancing the budget. So uh, I think that it did have a, a positive effect. I do think we need to drive more of that. And I think the issue of courage and the willingness to stand up to your own party and your own interests is something we also need. Can to I ask you guys a quick you. question? Thank Thank you. I, Mr. The, mayor, the mayor brought it up talking about the changes that what you all did uh, has done. You know, from the outside, you read the headlines and there's a supermajority in California now of Democrats. And you would expect a supermajority of Democrats to do what supermajorities of Democrats always do. Spend way too much money and tax way too much. But there's this moderating impact, actually. Like the reforms are leading to more moderate pro-business Democrats why is that? Well, because of the redistrict, uh, redistricting reform. And the open because primaries. Because in the open primaries. And the open primaries. Because in you have to now, have have to to now go and answer to both, the Democrats and Republicans. And you're absolutely correct, and I think the mayor pointed it out, that the Democrats now have come to the center. Even though there are no Republicans now, they, they could be in their way. They have come to the center because when they go back to their district, they have to answer the Democrats and Republicans. And, Republicans, yeah. and so what has happened is that out of, uh, for instance, 42 of job killing bills that the, the chamber has pointed out as job killing uh, uh, bills, they actually only voted for one, which was yeah. to raise the minimum wage. And everything else they killed. Yeah. Democrats. Yeah. It would have never, ever happened five years wow. ago. So this is just to show you the changes that happened. And as the, uh, the, the mayor has pointed out, that with immigration reform, I mean, the Republicans were vividly against that. Any uh, you know, immigration reform. But all of a sudden, they voted for immigration reform because, again, they had to answer to more Democrats and uh, because of the redistricting and because of open primaries. So that is why I think this is so important to create those reforms. And that's why I'm so happy that afterwards we have a panel discussion with the good government uh, you know, advocate uh, groups and uh, political, political groups that they're really fighting for that and that they're very passionate about this because we can do something like that nationwide. Yeah. Two vignettes from that to answer yours, and then we're, and then we're going to start taking questions. But the, uh, in one budget negotiation, the, the leaders were at the table. The Democrats had, had made commitments on some things to close the budget deal. Uh, and then during the two weeks while we were still negotiating, the AFL-CIO had come up and taken members of the Democratic caucus at, over at the Sheraton Hotel across from the Capitol and took them in one at a time and said, if you vote for any of these measures, we're going to run a primary candidate against you. And lo and behold, we came back into negotiations, and the Speaker of the Assembly at the time said, I, I don't have the votes. To, and the Republicans went crazy going, you're taking back the deal you made. He said, I don't have the votes. I can't, I've lost the votes to do it. The closed primary allowed the special interest to come in and say, I'm going to run a primary candidate against you. And they, they, they literally walked, they, they would rather risk the wrath of their own leadership than they, than they could survive a, a primary right. challenge. When we had every budget deal that we did, where you have to get Republicans to, uh, to to vote for something where that might threaten them, where who did you go to? You went to the di you went to the districts that were close enough together where they had to worry about running against a Democrat in the general election. Those are the only Republicans that you could get to even think about crossing party. I mean, and that, that's totally issue. changed now with the open primary and the combined top with, two. The, with the top two, the the um, the jungle primary yeah. they call it. 
now the math changes because now a clo you don't have the protection of a closed primary system. Somebody can come from your right or your left and put together a coalition of voters that includes the moderates in your party, mm. the independents, and some of the other party. That's great. And that's what has wow. changed the political math in, wow. in California. That's exciting. Question. Hi. Um, I watch your show every morning. I DVR it. <laughs> oh, God, I was going to say. And I watch it every morning. We're yeah. big fans. And um, we wonder every morning why there aren't more shows like yours. What are those barriers that we're facing now, seeing that there is the success that you guys enjoy now? You know, I don't know because, to tell you the truth, before we came on, we had uh, nobody in 10-year history of our network had ever beaten CNN or headline news in the morning in the demo or overall. We now overall almost double uh, CNN and we make lots and lots and lots of money for NBC. So I don't really know why more haven't followed. But well, there are more, but it's much harder than it looks. And CBS has, they wanted us, but they made one and it's pretty good. Um, there are other cable net, cable shows that they're trying to put people together and you know make it work, but it's much harder than it looks. It's a lot of nuance, a lot of understanding um, the political system or TV or journalism to the point where you know what to say and what not to say. And actually, there've been a lot of slip-ups made by hosts because they don't they don't understand the invisible guardrails. And it's harder than it looks. They have tried. And People also, are trying. you know, Mika and I go out and we say what we believe. I say, okay, well, you know, I'll, you I'll talk. You also have to have people who know what they believe. I'll talk about my views, and and I'll get beat up by five liberals around the table, and we'll all have a lot of fun. Mika will go out, and she doesn't play quote journalist. No. Uh, she actually tells people what she thinks, and and that works. Um, because people know where we're coming from. I think a lot of other people, quite frankly, are too busy playing TV and posing. It's what, that's what TV is. Uh, and pretending that they're objective journalists. None of us are objective. Seriously, if you've got what somebody a that's a, a journalist during, let's say, the Iraq War, or 12 years in in Afghanistan, and they don't have opinion on that... I don't want to watch them. You probably don't... You probably not only don't want to watch them... Uh, deliver the news, you probably wouldn't want them to operate a blender in your house because they would be so stupid. And I, I, it's just, they're still playing TV. But thank you for watching. Okay, okay. Shorter, okay. shorter answers. I have a three hour talk okay, show. Yeah. What do you expect? We got, I got a lot of people. Okay, we'll go fast. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Nathaniel Haas. I have a question. On Meet the Press uh, a few years or a couple of years ago, you said that the Republicans would not have maintained their majority in the House in 2012 had it not been for the gerrymandering of districts. Right. So my question for the panel is, if the nation had adopted the same redistricting reforms that California had adopted, how do you think those races would have been different? And do you think that it would have had an influence on, on the majority that the Republicans were able to make? Mika, are you doing a little product placement here? I you was. Place to be. I was. I was taking a picture of the chair as well. He spoke because I know this. Mika's is very excited. If you watch the show, you know that she's very irritated okay, with Apple. Okay, first of all, Steve how Jobs many of you have an iPhone? It's, you really shouldn't. We all have iPhones. Anyhow, iPhones. back to oh, his iPhones. important question. But now Mika has the Samsung thing. Yeah. You can like, it's, it's like amazing. Dick Tracy. I just took a picture of all of you. And all this other stuff. <laughs> You, no, listen, there's no doubt about it. The, the, the seats have been chopped up in the House in such a way that, that it allowed Republicans to stay in power despite the fact they didn't get 50% of the vote. Um, but if you could implement the reforms that you all have passed in California, we wouldn't just be talking about 51 versus 49. We would be talking about changing the entire way Washington worked because just like you said, I mean, so many people just focused on their primary fight. And anybody that's ever run politics before knows, you know, so you got 100% of the people, maybe 70% of them vote. Of those 70% of vote, maybe a third of them are Republicans <laughs> and 15% of them vote in every primary. And by the time you get whittled down, it's the extremes. And so, yeah, this these sort of reforms but, make a huge difference. But the idea of the reforms was not to favor the Democrats or to favor the Republicans. The idea was 
that the same amount go to Washington, same amount of Democrats, same amount of Republicans, but different types of candidates. Right. Candidates that are more in the center, that are willing to sit down with the other party and say, let's go to work and let's fix this problem. We have a serious problem. In the last you know, uh, five years, our debt went up by $7 trillion. There's a problem, and we are adding another trillion this next year or the next two years. So let's stop that. Let's figure out a way of how to stop the deficit and how to stop the debt from increasing. What can we do? This is not existing now. You know, it's just like a fixing, putting a Band-Aid over, over it and hope that they can get through this year to the election time so that uh, everyone has their own little game going. But to fix the problem and to really do something that's good for the country, doesn't exist. Right. And so this is what I'm talking about. Those reforms will bring people more to the sand and therefore more things will get done. And by the way, if Republicans pull their head out of the sand, they'll start winning in California again. <laughs> that could easily be. No, yeah, they, yeah, no, yeah. They, we, know, we know where their head was. They will. You don't know about the California Republicans. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. I mean, I've gotten to know them very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Rapid fire. Uh, my name is Keshav S. Nair, and I'd first like to thank you for this enlightening discussion. Um, I'd like to bring this back to the title of the discussion, Is There an End in Sight? Because we've heard a lot about the problems that there are and what causes the problems, but do you see a solution to those problems or an end to these problems and the lack of respect in D.C.? Yeah, yeah it's market-driven. When you have politicians, at some point, somebody's going to run for president, or you're going to have a lot of people starting to run for senator and say, hey, wait a second. I'm not going to have my, quote, Bullworth moment. I'm going to have my Bullworth campaign. I'm going, to tell my, I'm going to tell people what I think. I'm going to tell senior citizens that Medicare will not be solvent in 10 to 15 years if we keep spending at the rate that we're spending. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell, go on military bases, and I'm going to tell them, we're going to have to cut the defense budget because the United States of America doesn't have to spend more money than every other country on the planet on defense. I'm going to go to Wall Street and I'm going to tell hedge fund people that it's immoral that they're paying 14% taxes when their secretaries are paying 28, 29% taxes. And when you have Republicans doing that, do you know what will happen? They'll win Republican primaries. Mm. And when you have Democrats actually challenging their special interests and say, hey, you know what? We spend more money than any country on the planet in K through 12 per pupil. Don't come and ask us for four, more money until you and the teacher unions start rewarding success and start punishing failure. Do you know what would happen if a Democrat did that in a Democratic primary? I don't know that win. <laughs> Courage wins. It's contagious. It really is. And at some point, this is market driven. People are going to figure that out when they stop fearing their own shadow. I think some uh, pretty amazing things are going to happen. And I'm not being Pollyannish. I think it is going to happen. I totally agree with you. In your book, The Right Path, you said that super PACs and extremists are pushing the Republican Party off a cliff. Uh, off a cliff. In the 60s, the, the conservatives actually pushed back against George Wallace and Rand and the John Birch Society. In your opinion, who are the George Wallace's, Anne Rand's, and John Birch Society that you feel conservatives should push back against today? Well, I think they're, pu I think they're pushing back against them now. I think it's the Mark Levins. I, I, think it's, I think it's other people that in the blogosphere, political blogosphere, uh, that are, are extremist voices that get rewarded for taking the most extreme positions possible. And I think you're starting to see, especially after the government shutdown, there are a couple of senators in my party that I may actually contribute to because I want to keep them there because they blow themselves up and they actually have done more to help the Republican Party move back to the center than any any <sighs> Main Street Republican could have. That's heft up. Could I? No, <laughs> uh, no. I, I, I think we have figured out in Washington, I don't know about Sacramento, <laughs> that what we've been doing has cost us to lose five out of the last six presidential elections in the popular vote. I think, I think that's happening again. Could I quickly follow up with you guys? 
what do you and Mika think about and feel about the Tea Party? Mika? <laughs> How many of you would like to see Elizabeth Warren run for president? Oh, good Lord. See? That's how I feel. That's good. Okay. okay. See, uh, isn't that know, amazing, Joe? What you just—you know, uh, there, there, there are a lot of a lot of positive things for me about the Tea Party. He's a small government conservative, um, but there's a lot, a lot that was taken to a, to an extreme. And again, a lot of this goes to rank amateurs coming to Washington D.C. and not realizing that you get half a loaf. You know, that's better than nothing. There, Ronald Reagan's always misquoted. Uh, you know, just because I'm your friend 80% of the time doesn't make me your enemy 20% of the time. Ronald Reagan never said that. What Reagan said is, I'll take my 80% now. I'll come back and try and get the 20% later. A lot of people in the Tea Party didn't figure that out. A lot of people in the Tea Party didn't listen to people like me, Charles Krauthammer, Scott Walker, that said, don't shut down the government. It was like a slow motion train accident shutting down you know, the government. And they didn't listen. They're listening now. A couple more. You don't think so. I wrap think up over here. Hi. So I completely understand what you're saying about, you know, don't being afraid of um, failure and all of this. And I understand that you really do have kind of this idealistic view that things can change in the next couple of years. But as a graduating senior this year, um, and along with my uh, fellow peers here today, what advice would you give to us, kind of the next generation of politicians or leaders or business people um, in terms of ending this gridlock? Or voters. You're asking whom? Yes. Uh, any Vote and run. Get involved with campaigns you believe in. Get involved. Yeah, I think Serve. I said that in my speech, I think the most important thing is to fight for what you believe in to never give up, get involved in public service, um, go and run for office, uh, be out there and create the change rather than sitting there in front of the television and just complaining about what's going on. I mean, too many people do that. I think to get up and to actually create action and to do something about it, that is what we need, what we need to do. And that's what your kids and your students need to do. You're not gonna run in the next couple of years, get involved in campaigns and see what works, see what doesn't work, uh, and see how far That's you can That's great push advice. It. We have time for a few more. You said such wonderful things about uh, the, the necessity of voting and about young people not participating, that it isn't because they're lazy, and I totally agree with that. A lot of times as a voter, uh, what I see on a ballot is exactly what you said. I have the choice between people who are going to run to their corners. That does make me feel powerless, even Oof. as a voter. That's what terrible. more can I do and can anybody do to, uh, to create a better situation? And I know some of it you covered there, but voting alone right now to a lot of people, I would never not do it. It's, it's a, a right that I value so much, but it feels more limited now than it has in other times in my life. Get involved in initiatives uh, that, that do exactly what they're talking about doing right here. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, and gerrymandering, uh, the, the system uh, that, that, that takes place across the country right now, what, 24 states, you think, mm -hmm. they're ballot initiatives? That's right. Well, I, I, I give you an example. I went up to Sacramento several times and ask the legislature to give us more money for after school programs because more and more kids come from families that were both of the parents are working. So now it's like 70% of the families where both of the parents are working and the kids are now in the afternoon out there by themselves. There's no one there helping them with tutoring, with homework assistance or with sports programs. And they get into problems in the danger zones of, uh, which is they always call the danger zone, uh, where kids get involved in juvenile crime and teenage pregnancy and all those things. So we can do better than that. And the legislators wouldn't listen because of course the kids don't have a lobbyist up there, right? So nothing happened. So eventually I gathered the signatures and I took it to the ballot. And it cost me a lot of money personally, and I also raised a lot of money. It cost $13 million to put it on the ballot and to actually bring it to victory. 57% of the people voted yes on that, and uh, California got 428 
million dollars a year extra money for after-school programs, which is now over $550 million. So, I mean, it's great, great things have happened because of that, because I didn't wait for the legislature. I didn't wait and just sit around and say, God damn it, they don't do anything. I'm so frustrated. No matter how many times you go to the polls, nothing happens and blah, blah. No, I did something about it. And so when you're passionate about something, you can create change. I remember at USC, at one of uh, Nancy Stout's classes, uh, the kids literally fought the city of Los Angeles with the murals because they all of a sudden forbid because they called it graffiti. They said, no more painting on any public buildings and any pu public properties and blah, 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 and all those things. And for 10 years, you couldn't see any new murals. But it was USC students, two of them, that went out and did all the research in the world and went with all this knowledge, met, met with the planning commission and with the city hall, with the city officials and with everybody and eventually got the law changed mm. after 10 years. Wow. Now there you see murals again, uh, you know, and uh, appearing and painters can go out there and paint and do all this stuff. So it just shows you that if you get involved and if you're passionate about something, then you would do it. And I, I, I can do, I mean, I've been involved with the fitness crusade for the last 45 years, where people said if you start working out, you're going to get stupid and gay and, uh, and, and, and that's a narcissist and uh, it's it will why, be terrible for your health. That's why I don't work out. Exactly. Terrible right. for your health. But, but now, 45 years later, every hotel has a fitness uh, room. That's right. Every gymnasium. I every stay away sports, from uh, every You need to check one out, Joe. Every athlete is using yeah. weight resistance training. And everything. Yeah. So the fitness crew said, look, if you feel passionate about something, you will continue fighting and fighting and fighting until you get your way. And that's what you have to do rather than just go out and vote. That's one great privilege. But we have so many other great privileges. And I think this is what makes this country so great, that we have that freedom to do those things. And you, you may not be able to, 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 to make as big of a difference as, as the governor did in this initiative, but you know what? Get, get, you know, find something that you're passionate about, that you believe in. And, you know, Bobby Kennedy gave a great speech in Cape Town in 1966 talking about how a million different individuals creating different energy sources from a million different places you know, could rise up and actually bend history itself. But a lot of that has to do with, you know, you gotta sacrifice yourself and maybe it's not money, but maybe it's sweat equity. You're a woman, run it's for office. Like, yeah, We're more practical run for the anyway. Office. It's kind of like the University of Alabama, you know. We, um, we need more women. We give till it hurts. We, uh, we actually choices. took Lane Kiffin off your hands, so. <laughs> but, All right, thank you very much. I think, uh, we, we have time for more or somebody? Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Thank, well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you guys.